Good morning. Welcome to church. Let's uh, open up our hymns to page two and sing How Great Thou Art. If you'd stand and sing with us, we'll do all the verses for How Great Thou Art. seated. We'll uh, turn to the Lord in prayer this morning. Um, we'll pray for Carol. She's got her broken ankle. It's going to be about six to eight weeks uh, to heal. Uh, I'm going to pray for uh, Mike as he's looking back at work and the family. Um, 
Tommy and Kaylin were married yesterday and start their uh, honeymoon as well as Carrie and Cody. So I just pray that they have a, a good time and uh, pray for their marriages. And it was uh, good to go to the, I got to go to Tom and Kaylin's wedding. And so that was good. Um, we got all our regular people to keep in our prayers there. I don't know if there's any other that um, I missed. Doesn't look like anyone's got um, any that we missed. So uh, let's just uh, turn to the Lord in prayer this morning. And um, Lord, we just come to you this morning and uh, we ask that uh, you would teach us this morning, Lord, that you would. Um, Help us as, as we turn to your word that you would teach us by it. Um, instruct us by your spirit, Lord. Um, give us the help that we need uh, today and, and throughout our weeks. I pray for Carol that you would help her ankle to heal, Lord. Um, help her as she's on crutches and just that the healing would um, go well. Pray for Herman uh, with his foot that uh, uh, it still hurts and is in pain, and so I ask that you would help that uh, to um, get better and um, not continue to get worse. So I pray for his foot that you would uh, give him some relief um, with it. Um, pray for Cassie as she continues to recover her uh, leg and back. And pray for Becca Kegel, Lord, with cancer and, and her family. And, um, Jason uh, Miller, um, to the same end, his family as his, his cancer has worsened and, and they quit treatment. We want to continue to keep him and, and his family in our prayers and, and lift them up to you. Uh, pray for um, Jane and Nicole as well. Uh, help them. Um, thank you that uh, Karen's treatment has went well and, and continue to pray for her as, as she heals as well. And um, we pray for Lou's daughter, uh, Mickey, as she's having a baby this Tuesday. Help the uh, birth to go well um, as they induce labor. You know, she's been there a few times already, um, feeling like labor was coming on. And, and so um, they told her it wasn't ready. And, and so we pray that the, the delivery would go well, Lord. Pray for her uh, health and safety in, in it, as well as the babies, and that it would just go uh, really well. Um, and we also pray for Mike as he goes back to work and uh, Rachel and, and their kids and ask that you would just um, bless their family. Thank you for the time he's able to be back and help him as he's out on the road. And then finally, Lord, we pray and ask that you would bless um, Tom and Caitlin's marriage and, and Carrie and Cody's as well. Uh, we just lift them up to you and ask that you bless them and so, Lord, we um, just come to you to praise and worship you today and ask that you would bless this service. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's sing uh, When the Roll is Called Up Yonder. I thought uh, the last two verses of How Great Thou Art There, the one was about Jesus' sacrifice, um, bearing our burden and bleeding and dying to take away our sin. And then the next verse was uh, with Christ returning uh, with the shout of acclamation and, and the resurrection that will be brought to uh, when he returns. And so now we're going to sing about when the roll is called up yonder. Uh, at that moment when he comes back, we'll, we'll be there. Uh, by faith, those of us who believe will be. So let's, let's sing the handout. Uh, when the roll is called up yonder.
announcements this morning. Um, just remember to keep uh, the jail ministry in your prayers as Herman goes there. and um, Those who go help with him, I know Sean's not going to be able to as much now. and um, Lance has been able to go with him a few times. And, uh, and then I'll, I kind of fill in the gaps. So it's, it's just pray for us as we go. Pray for the guys there uh, that we're able to minister to. I know in a lot of them it's... It, it's uh, those that believe it's a really good ministry too and those who don't know the gospel get to hear it and so remember to keep jail ministry in your prayers uh, we have bible study here wednesdays 7 p.m uh, tom runs a bible study in coleraine thursdays at 10 a.m and then we're still looking forward to um, figuring out a date in the school year for uh, try and get a lord's army bible study going um, remember to keep on your calendars the uh, 22nd here for a um, potluck after church and uh, afternoon crafts with the ladies. Um, Cassie suggested maybe the guys, if we want to stay, can play some cards and do something like that. So I'll think about that. Um, Habitat for Humanity, the Faith Build. We've been talking about that for a long time. Finally, I have a date, uh, October 5th. Um, so I'll be calling all you that we've got on the list and um, if you're not on the list and you want to help uh, keep October 5th open um, I believe that's all the announcements next week I'm preaching uh, here and at West Classic Chapel so I'd appreciate your prayers as I prepare two sermons this, this week um, uh, kind of a long time coming final wrap up on the internship and just kind of going to have a potluck there with them so um, that's all that comes to mind, so let's continue on and sing I Must Tell Jesus, page 49. Sure. All four verses. <laughs>
sing Only Trust Him, hymn number 629. And uh, we've got a co an extra loud singer with us this morning. That's my, that's my niece. I do all three verses. Well, let's pray before we begin. Lord, we come to you again this morning as we turn to your word and ask that you would bless us um, by the reading of it today. Ask that you would help us to understand it. Um, help me as I speak um, and just help us all as, as we uh, come in, uh, this morning to learn from you. Help us to be able to apply your word to our lives today and we pray and ask this and Jesus' name, amen. Well, Tuesday and Wednesday, I'll tell you a little bit about my week. I worked 7 a.m. to 6.30 p.m. And then Thursday night we went and um, visited with a retired um, pastor and his family who we're friends with. They happened to be in town from out of state. Uh, then Friday night, I, I felt sick and slept in yesterday. I slept from like 4.30 p.m. after work on Friday till like 7 p.m. Went back to bed after I ate a few slices of pizza, woke up at 10, 11 a.m. And then we got up and went ready and went to Tom and, Tommy and Kaylin's wedding yesterday. Thank you, Lily. And then after that, <coughs> we drove uh, straight from Hibbing over to uh, out on 6 to West Cohasset, went to their annual pig roast, which uh, we stayed there till about 7.30, and then I went to worship in the Pines, which was an event at E-Free, it ran from 7 to 8.30. Now my pastor friend George warned me about that sort of thing, he said don't get burnout. He did that early on in ministry, he felt he neglected his family too much. He worked bivocationally as well. Uh, he says that he regretted some of his uh, decisions early on in his ministry. And I say all that um, because I, th I think it's important. The reason I think it's important is to remember other people in the week they've had. And I'm not sharing it so that you feel pity for me or sorry for me or that I need to have things change. I'm just saying it so that we think about other people in their weeks. I sat next to a guy at, at the wedding 
this woman and this guy, and they didn't want to hear the gospel. Tom was preaching the gospel at the wedding. They didn't want to hear it. Uh, it was physically, like, painful for them. They were letting out breaths like they were in pain, like, whew, like it was hurting them to hear it. This is the way that they were acting. They were openly complaining, whispering loud enough to one another so we could hear everything they were saying. And, and so I thought about their week. I wondered what the weeks of their lives were like. And I wondered why they found the message so offensive. I think we need to do that. We need to think about people and their days and, and their weeks and how do we reach them? I went last night to worship in the Pines. Kind of had a rare opportunity twice in that day to be preached at. Us pastors normally don't get to feel what it's like to be preached at in the context of a worship service. Uh, my wife allowed me this opportunity for that I'm grateful for. As Tom said at the wedding yesterday about his wife, he wouldn't be where he was without her. And I wouldn't be where I was without mine. Us men don't get along well without our wives. So it does us all good to go to a wedding and think about uh, the grander things in life. Things uh, like life, lifelong things like love and marriage and commitment. Important things. And so I had a rare gem of a Saturday and I heard preaching. And I had fellowship in many contexts with many other believers. And I heard them preaching three times at three different places. And you know what I heard everywhere that I went, what was preached everywhere I went, was the gospel. It was the same message, that Jesus died for our sins. He was buried and he rose again. Tom preached and shared the good news that Jesus can save us from eternity without sin. Excuse me, from an eternity without him. An eternity where we pay for our sins with our death in hell eternally. And that all that it takes to be saved from that fate is believing in Jesus' payment on the cross for our sins. Now this guy sitting next to me, we got to talk for a few minutes afterwards, and I tried to share with him about Jesus, but he told me he's free from religion and free of religion, and he's not interested in religion. And <clears throat> so I told him, you know, I noticed how he bowed his head during prayer, and even though he didn't believe that, you know, I respected that. And so we talked about respecting other others and their beliefs and how I thought that if the world is going to demand that Christianity is going to be accepting of everyone, then they should probably practice what they preach and they should be accepting of us as we are. And uh, I continued to try and talk to him about Jesus, try and get an inroad somewhere, but it wasn't going to happen. He made it clear, uh, even though I was being kind and respectful to him. So we had a part ways. He, he repeated himself. He's free from religion and of religion, and he's not interested in talking about it anymore. Now, he didn't know anything about my past week, and I didn't know anything about his. Now, sometimes when the seed is sown, it doesn't always go on good soil, and so we pray, we plant, others water, but God causes the growth. And so everywhere I went yesterday, the gospel was preached. Three different churches, all the same message. But not every one that I ran across believed it. He said, it was still preached, though, and, and Jesus died to save us from our sins. And that's the good news. He rose again. It's the antidote to our problem. He's the antidote to our poison, the poison of sin, which brings us death. Not only did he die to pay for our sins, he rose again. Now we don't have to die, and we will rise again. And we sang about that. We sang about Jesus paying for our sins. The next verse, we're going to rise again. We sang about when the role is called up yonder. I really like that when God works his, the songs right into the message. That's nice. Uh, and so we'll rise again. Both sin and death have been defeated, and we await our resurrection. That was uh, kind of the focus that, um, at the third message, uh, Greg Rodet, he's pastor over at Grace Bible, a friend of mine, and uh, I talked to him at the community event at E-Free, and uh, I promise we're going to get to Hebrews here, but just one last tidbit from yesterday. He, I, I told him that was really good. He said that I could borrow from him, go ahead, take the low-hanging fruit. I said, okay. So uh, as he was preaching, he pointed out about the idea of resurrection. It's, it's a crazy idea. And we as Christians can tend to forget that. I realized when he was talking that while I was trying to witness to this guy at this wedding, I had forgotten that. Sometimes it's good to ask, what am I asking these people to believe? And so how do I witness to them? 
Uh, but as Greg continued, as he reminded us about the idea of the resurrection, he said, you know, the Greeks didn't believe in resurrection. They didn't believe people could come back from the dead. And we kind of, as Christians, tend to accept it as commonplace. Jesus died and rose again. We've heard it a thousand times. It's almost like we think, well, back then when Jesus was here, they weren't used to that idea. They, they were used to that idea. You know, people back then, they rose from the dead all the time. No, they didn't. Uh, it's, people never rose again from the dead. That just doesn't happen. And the Greeks wouldn't have wanted that anyways. It wouldn't have been a concept that they would have been happy with. They thought the body was bad and in death that their soul was freed. And so they wouldn't have been wanted to resurrect it back to a body. And the Jews, half of them didn't believe in the resurrection. You see the Sadducees didn't believe that. And they argued with the Pharisees about it. And the other half of the Jews, they thought that resurrection was a mass event once at the end of time when God set the world right. And none of them thought, oh yeah, resurrection, that's a normal thing. And so as he was preaching the gospel, he was reminding us how the resurrection of Jesus is central for us. It is the cure. It is the answer to death. Not only did he die to pay for our sins, but he ascended to the Father's right hand and he's going to come back and set everything right. It's, it's the totality that uh, he died, he was buried, and he rose again, and death has been defeated. 1 Corinthians 15 talks about this in verse 54, when we're raised from the dead. It says, so when this corruptible, that's, that's the corruptible body we have, shall have put on the incorruptible, and this mortal shall have put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Where, O death, is thy sting? Where, O grave, is thy victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, be unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. So the good news is all about the death setting us free. It's all about his burial and resurrection, which swallows up death and gives us victory, new life. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Jesus was talking to a Jew, to Martha, about the idea of resurrection. Now Lazarus, who had died, they were talking about him, her brother. And, and Jesus said, your brother will rise again. It's in John 11. And uh, we, he kind of said, your brother will rise again. And Martha took it the way that we say to a person at a funeral. Lazarus was already dead. They were basically at a funeral. And Jesus said, well, he'll rise again you'll see him in heaven. And so that's the way Martha took it. it. says, yeah, I know, I'll see him in heaven. At the resurrection, at the end. Verse John 11, verse 21, Martha says, you know, Jesus, he wouldn't have died if you had been here to heal him. Verse 22, Jesus said, well, he'll rise again. And Martha replied, I know that he'll rise again in the resurrection at the last day. And the Jews thought that the resurrection was just at the last day. And Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. And everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? Do you believe this? I'm asking you. It's quite a thing. It's a marvel. Resurrection from the dead. That's what we're preaching. That's what we're telling people to believe. And so we should consider that when, we are, uh, when we're preaching the word to people, when we're telling them about it. Uh, it's... Sometimes I think we get lost in that. We share the, we share the message, and I wonder why they didn't believe that. Well, maybe, maybe we needed to go a little deeper with them and, and, and get a little bit more you know, in depth with them. Now, 1 Corinthians, we, I, I, let's go back to that again just briefly before we get into Hebrews. Uh, the earlier, this is earlier to the portion that I already mentioned in chapter 15. Chapter 15, verse 14 uh, it says, and if Christ has not been raised, then all of our preaching is, is useless and your, and your faith is useless. If what this guy I was talking to told me is true, that Jesus is just mythology, then my faith is useless. And if that were the case, then the apostles would have been lying about God because they said that Christ, God raised Christ from the grave. But that can't be true if there's no resurrection. And if there's no resurrection, then Christ hasn't been raised. And if Christ hasn't been raised, then your faith is useless and you're still guilty of your sins. And in that case, all who have died believing in Christ are lost. And if our only hope in Christ is only for this life, then we're to be pitied more than anyone in the whole world. But, verse 20, in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. 
He is the first of a great harvest of all who has died. So you see, just as death came into the world through a man, now the resurrection from the dead has begun through another man. That's the gospel. That's the good news. The good news that we can have life through Jesus who has raised again. The resurrection uh, is central. His death, burial, and resurrection are central. That's what our faith is about, and that's what Christians are preaching everywhere. And that is what we find in Hebrews 10. Hebrews 10, we'll turn there now, verses... Uh, We've already covered through verse 14 two weeks ago here, but verses 3 and 4 of chapter 10, uh, they had a system that they were given, uh, sacrifices. Uh, verse 2, they would, wouldn't, uh, they have been ceasing to offer sacrifices uh, because the worshipers would have no more guilt of sin if, if they could have made been made perfect, verse 1, uh, from their continual year-by-year -year sacrifices, but rather, verse 3, in those sacrifices, there is a remembrance again made of sins every year. For it's not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sin. So Christ never uh, gave, Jesus, God never gave the Jewish people that system to take away their sins. It wasn't possible. Uh, he says in verse 11, every priest stands daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. It wasn't, he didn't give that system to do that. But, verse 12, Jesus, this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. There we see the resurrection of the gospel in this verse in chapter 10 sat down at the right hand of God from henceforth expecting until his enemies be made his footstool, until he comes back and sets the world right. For by that one offering he has perfected forever them that are sanctified. Now we talked about that last uh, two weeks ago. We weren't made perfect in that we have no sin except that we were made perfect in that we have no sin. In the sight of God through Jesus we're made spotless through Jesus. And that doesn't mean uh, John is still right when he says if we say we're without sin, we're a liar and the truth is not in us. And it's still true when Paul said, it's no longer I who sin, but rather it's sin living in me. So he's not saying that we're never going to sin again. What he's saying is in, through the gospel, through Jesus' one sacrifice, he paid for our sins in the past, he paid for our sins in the present, and he paid for our sins in the future. So we can look to the future and know that those sins are paid for, and when God looks upon us, he sees that Jesus paid for those sins, and in that way, we're perfected through Jesus. And that's what he's saying in this verse here. He's saying, by that one offering, he paid for our sins for all time, where the Holy Ghost is a witness to that. For after that, he said, This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds I will write them, and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Now where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. So once it's been paid doesn't need to be paid again. Where, where there's been remission, where it's been paid, there's no more need of offering of sin because, because it's already been paid for. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, through his flesh, and having a high priest over the house of God, since the covenant is changed, since we're in the holy of holies through Jesus' blood, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. Full assurance of faith. Having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he that is faithful, he is faithful that has promised it. You should just stop and soak that in. Let us hold fast to the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. We're going to get into a part in the next couple verses that might make us question, and we want to remember that part and soak it in. We already, you'll remember we went through chapter 6 in Hebrews, chapter 6, verses 17, uh, excuse me, chapter 6, verses yeah, 17 to 19. 
wherein God willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability, the unchangeable nature of his counsel, he confirmed it by an oath, so that by two immutable things, two unchangeable things, in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us, which hope we have as an anchor for the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which enters into that within the veil, into the Holy of Holies, into the place where God is, an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. You'll remember that when we read chapter 6, we also read verses 4 to 6. We read about it's impossible for those who were once enlightened and who have tasted the heavenly gift and who were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come if they shall fall away to renew them again under repentance, seeing that they crucify to themselves the Son of God afresh and put him to open shame. And that causes, verses like that cause us to go, what? So you can get it and then lose it? And he says, no, that's not the way that this works. He says, verse 9, but beloved, we are persuaded better things of you and things that accompany salvation. And we're talking in this way. And we went through the context of all of that. He said, beloved, that's not you. You accompany salvation. You have an anchor firm and steadfast. Now, last week I preached from Matthew 25, and I did that on purpose looking forward to Hebrews 10 here. Because the parable that I preach from on face value, it doesn't sound nice. It's hard to read that and not see us as the servants, and the one servant is told uh, that he gets thrown out. And so, uh, you know, I had someone tell me, Jim, I was worried. I was worried where you were going with that, but then you explained it and it was good. But I, I want to speak to that worry. I don't have anything against the guy who told me that. And I know his, his concern was for others. I just want to say, listen, friends, like I'm going where the text goes. I'm not going to change the scriptures. Matthew 25, if Jesus said it, then you can bank on it. You do have to understand the context in which he said it. In Hebrews 10, same thing. If Jesus said it, if God inspired this, then you have to accept it. Uh, Verse 23, let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. You know, I was telling you, I was talking with George, a pastor friend of mine, and he said, uh, you know, we always have to preach the context. Uh, we always have to preach um, what the word says. He says, you know, you can take sometimes a say, this is the verses I like, and then I don't like these ones as much, so let's focus on these ones. Well, I don't know if we really have the liberty to do that. You know, what George said, he said, well, God knew the point he was making when he wrote it, so let's stick with that point. You know, a lot of times you'll have a preacher who he wants to preach a point, and he doesn't always preach it from that text. Well, God's got a point he's making in the text that he wants us all to understand, so we should, we should focus on that. We should see what is he trying to tell us. So let's pick up and back up in chapter 10. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. And let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much more as you see the day approaching. For if we sin willfully, after we have received the knowledge of truth, there remains no more sacrifice for sins. That kind of sounds like, uh, well, scary. I think, well, he's not going to forgive me if I sin again and I did it on purpose. Well, maybe you should look back to verse 18. Well, where there's remission of these, there's no more an offering for sin. Those two verses kind of work together. Where there's remission of these, where it's already been paid, it doesn't need to be paid again. So maybe we can take verse 26 that way. And so it's after there remains no more sacrifice, it was already paid for. But then, verse 27 makes a shift, and it kind of sounds a little bit more like what we thought. It says, but a certain fearful, look, there remains no more sacrifice for sin, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation. What shall devour who? The adversaries. So again, that's another clue. That's not us. That's the adversaries of God. He continues, he that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two or three witnesses. Of how much sore punishment do you suppose shall he be thought to
to have to worry, who has trodden under the foot of the Son of God and who has counted the blood of the covenant, wherewith he was sanctified, an unholy thing, and hath done despite of the Spirit of grace. For we know him that hath said, Vengeance belongeth unto me, and I will recompense. I'll pay back, says the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. It's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. But call into remembrance the former days in which after you were illuminated, you endured a great fight of afflictions, partly while you were made a gazing stock, both by reproaches and afflictions, and partly while you became companions of them that were so used, while you were companions of those that were made the same. For you had compassion of me and my bonds, and you took joyfully the spoiling of your goods. And they were compassionate to the writer of Hebrews. They, they shared their goods with him, knowing in themselves that you have a better, you have in heaven a better and an enduring substance. Cast not away, therefore, your confidence, which has great recompense of reward. He says, so he tells them, hold fast to the profession of faith. He that is faithful is promised. Then he gives them a warning, and then he says, cast not away, therefore, your confidence, because there's a reward for that. For you, you have need of patience now that after you have done the will of God, you will receive, you might receive the promise. You'll receive the promise for yet a little while, and he that shall come will come. He's talking about the resurrection. Jesus is at the right hand of God. He will come, will come. He'll be coming back, and he won't tarry. Now this is how it works. The just shall live by faith. The righteous live by faith. But if any man draw back, that is, if any doesn't have faith, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. But we are not of them who draw back unto perdition. Rather, we are of them that believe to the saving of the soul. Did in the same thing as he did in chapter 6. That's not you. you know, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. By it, the elders obtain a good report. Through faith, we understand God made the world. By faith, Abel. By faith, Enoch, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. It's always by faith, from faith to faith. But we shouldn't think for a second that one negates the other. It is a dreadful thing to fall in the hands of the living God. That's a quotation of previous scripture. And God did say judgment will start with his people. And that is a fearful thing. And I've heard Tom and, and Herman both talk about the white, great others as well, talk about the great white throne judgment, the judgment at the end when his revelation says that all humans will be called to give an account and will all have to answer for every deed, the word says, whether to the good or the bad. The books will be open. You know, I didn't, I'll, tell, I'll be honest, I didn't want to become a preacher. God says in James that those of you who teach ought to be more careful because you judge more strictly. So what we should be reminded from the scripture is that while we are saved, while we hold fast without wavering, while we know that we are not of them who draw back, but we have faith under the saving of the soul, while we know all that, we still shouldn't forget that God will still judge us. We'll be forgiven our sins if we have faith in him. That's an anchor for the soul. That's a sure thing. We'll be forgiven. We'll, have to be given, we'll also have to give an account. We'll be able to point to Jesus and say we're we're perfect through him, but every deed to the good or bad. And do we want to hide our talent in the ground? Do we want to bury it? I'm not using it. No, no, we don't want to do that. Now, as I said, that parable was in the context of his return. It was separation of the sheep from the goats. It wasn't a parable about loss of salvation. Loved ones, chapter 6, verse 9, that's not you. Chapter 10, verses 38 to 39, that's not you. But still it is mentioned, Okay. And I didn't write it, and it's true. It is a terrible thing to fall into the hands of the living God, and he will take revenge. I will take recompense, he says, and that means payback. And so we're exhorted to live well by faith. That's the drumbeat, by faith, by faith, by faith. Chapter 11, that's all it's going to be when we get into it next week. But we shouldn't forget judgment. We shouldn't forget the weeks that other people have. We, shouldn't for, we don't want to lose how to talk to them and engage them so that they listen. Because the only way that we escape, the only way that any humans escape divine judgment is by faith. 
And faith is being certain of what we hope for. It's the very substance of it. Now, faith is the substance of the things hoped for. It's the evidence of the things that we can't see. It's the way that we understand his death, his burial, and his resurrection. God came as a man, as Jesus. Part one, he died and he was buried. Part two, he rose again. And part three, he's coming back. The resurrection is the proof. It's the proof that he's not dead, that he ascended to the right hand of the Father, and proof that he will return once again to set all things right. He is the resurrection and the life, and all that believe in him will be saved, because he that promised is faithful, and the righteous shall live by faith. So when we come to a passage like Hebrews 6 or Hebrews 10, we want to remember it in the context, just like Matthew 25, where Jesus was answering, what is it going to be like at the end? He said, here's four stories. It's going to be like these guys. And then he's going to separate the sheep from the goats. So take the parables in that way. When we come to chapter 10, it's always by faith. You have an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. That's been throughout the book. It's been that those who have faith shall enter the rest of God. It's been by faith, by faith, by faith. You, you can't get away from it in chapter 11. It's every, ten, it's every two sentences. It's always by faith. The just shall live by faith. We're not those who draw back, who don't have faith, but we're those that believe to the saving of the soul. We should still have to remember how the rest of all of it works. We have to remember people and the way that we can witness to them, the way that we share that gospel with them. Uh, I think that, you know, Greg had a good uh, point there. A lot of times we focus on the death and sometimes we forget uh, the, the resurrection and the life and we forget the, the wonder and awe of the raising from the dead. And so that's, that's uh, encouragement. Take, take it in its, in its um, context. It is, it's always been about faith. It's still about faith. And we're going to get into next week by faith, by faith, by faith. Um, I've digressed and now I don't have a good ending. So we're just going to pray. <laughs> Lord, we come to you today and we thank you for your word. We thank you. Uh, that you have um, given us the truth, that you remind us of the truth, that you have a constant drumbeat that the, the righteous have, shall live by faith. That's the Old Testament, the New Testament, um, repeated again and again throughout the scriptures, uh, that it is by faith that we come to you. It's by faith that we're saved, by grace and through faith, that not of ourselves. It's a gift of God. Uh, thank you for reminding us um, to live well, to remember other people, to remember uh, the way that their lives have gone and why they think the way that they do and why they don't believe the same thing and help us to remember uh, them, help us to remember where we were before we believed this so that we can witness well to them. I ask for your help for all of us to be able to share the gospel well. Uh, we ask that the gospel will go forth with... Uh, great power and in your name Lord help us to remember the awe of the um, supernatural nature uh, the, the totally opposite um, to the natural world uh, uh, resurrecting from the dead just the, the very things that we believe at its core and, and the supernatural nature we ask that by your Holy Spirit you would um, Prompt us to share the gospel with others. Give us the words to share it. We know that you will. And so we ask that you would help us to do that. And Lord, we pray this and ask it in uh, your son's name. Lord, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Let's close with uh, what a day that will be. I believe hymn number 314.
Thank you.